All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we're going to talk about the semicircular canals. So again, if you haven't already, please go watch the anatomy of the inner ear, watch the uh, video on the cochlea, watch the video on the vestibule, and then now we're going to talk about the semicircular canals. These are really, really important structures. All right, so let's go ahead and dig right in. So over here, we have a little crude diagram. If you remember, we've used this for the cochlea and the vestibule and stuff like that. So if you remember this part over here, this little coily-like part, we called that the cochlea, right? And we talked about that its role within the sound, right? The sound transduction from the sound waves. Then we talked about the vestibule and its components, right? Via the macula within the utricle and the saccule and their response to linear acceleration in the horizontal, uh, horizontal and vertical axis and head tilting. Now we're going to talk about these guys here, which is going to be these guys right here, these little half little uh, circles called the semi-circular canals. There's actually three of them, okay, three of them. And this is important to understand that because <clears throat> what's really cool about the semicircular canals is that they're oriented in such a way that they fulfill both the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. So any rotational acceleration, they can pick it up in any angle, which is, I, I don't know why, I just think that's so darn cool. So what are the different semicircular canals? So let's pretend that this is the right, all right, inner ear structure. This guy is going to be pointing out towards your ear. All right, so it's in the inner ear and it's pointing out towards the auricle. This one right here is going to be called the uh, horizontal or the lateral semicircular canal. All right, this is the lateral semicircular canal. Then you're going to have another one. And this one is actually going to be coming up like this. All right, it's going to be called the superior or the anterior semicircular canal. So you have this one right here, which is going to be the anterior semicircular canal. Then you have one more, which is going to be coming in the posterior part. All right, so this is going to be going backwards this way. This is going to be called the posterior semicircular canal. All right. Now, remember I told you that they're, hor they're oriented in specific types of axes. So let's take two different planes. Let's say I do a sagittal plane. Okay, what does that mean? I'm cutting right down here. Okay, I'm cutting down the sagittal plane from the nose all the way to the occiput. And I'm looking right here. Okay. Well, let's imagine here that we have the left ear and the right ear. Okay. What happens is, is you have the anterior semicircular canal which we're going to represent like this. Okay, there's the anterior, and here's the anterior. Then over here in the back, there's going to be another one called the posterior semicircular canal. And then these ones going out to the side, lateral, all right? These are going to be called your lateral semicircular canal. And the significance of this is really cool. In the sagittal plane, you have different angles that these semicircular canals are oriented in. So, from the posterior semicircular canal to this actual sagittal plane is a total of 56 degrees. So 56 degrees posteriorly and laterally from the sagittal plane you'll have what's called the posterior semicircular canal. Then from the anterior to the sagittal plane is approximately 41 degrees. So then you're going to have the anterior semicircular canal oriented 41 degrees anterior laterally, anterior laterally from the sagittal plane. Now, here's the next thing. If we look at the horizontal axis, right? So imagine here is going to be, uh, here's your nose, your mouth, right, like this, and then here is your eye, right? When you have this part here, you're going to have your uh, other, another canal, the horizontal canal. And imagine here we have, from the nasal occipital line here, we have an angle. And this actual lateral semicircular canal from the horizontal plane is approximately 25 degrees from the horizontal. So the lateral semicircular canal is located within 25 degrees above the horizontal plane. 
what the, why am I even mentioning these things? The whole purpose is, is that they're technically 90 degrees from one another. And because of that, that allows for them to be able to pick up rotations, pick up the actual angular acceleration from any type of angle and direction. That is what is so darn cool and interesting about this structures here, okay? So again, you have the lateral semicircular canal, which is like 25 degrees above the horizontal. Then you're gonna have over here the posterior semicircular canal, which is 56 degrees posterior laterally from the sagittal plane. The anterior semicircular canal, which is 41 degrees anterior laterally from the sagittal plane. And because of that, they have 90 degree angles for one another that allows for them to be able to pick up information with respect to angular acceleration within three axes. They can pick it up within the Y axis, they can pick it up from the X axis, and they can pick up information from the Z axis. That is just, I don't know why, so darn cool that they can pick up angular acceleration in any type of axes. All right, so we talked enough about that, that kind of stuff. Let's go to the next point. The next thing that we need to do is, is we have to kind of talk a little bit more about these semicircular canals. Remember how we did with the vestibule? We had that like that little, little kind of like uh, flow here. If we come down here again, let's follow that again. So you have what's called the outer bony labyrinth. And this is the one that's made up of perilymph. Right? Which is again, if we go over it again, it's going to be what? Rich in sodium, low in potassium. This consists of, this is the one that's actually we call the semicircular canals. This is the semicircular canals. Okay? The outer bony labyrinth contains a special structure inside of it. What is that special structure inside of it? They call that the inner membranous labyrinth and the inner membranous labyrinth if you remember is consisting of endolymph high in potassium low in sodium the special structure which is contained within the semicircular canals is called the semi circular ducts last point was this last part here where we said there's a special detector okay this last part here is the special detector or that sensory epithelium so what is that special detector or that sensory epithelium? Well, there's a certain part, and we're going to explain and show it here in a second. But there's a special detector or the sensory epithelium. It's actually located in a specific point in the semicircular ducts called the ampulla of the semicircular ducts. That structure is called the cristae ampullaris. Okay? So the cristae ampullaris is the special detector or the sensory epithelium. It's found within the ampulla of the semicircular ducts, which are consisting of endolymph, which is found inside of the outer bony labyrinth, which is filled with perilymph called the semicircular canals. Okay, so we know the different semicircular canals. We know that their, their actual uh, specific orientation with inside of the actual skull we know actually what is contained within the semicircular canals. One more thing. So now, when we talk about, when we talked about the utricle, when we talked about the saccule with the macula, they responded to linear acceleration in the vertical and horizontal axis, and the utricle played a role in head tilts, right? Well, this guy, the semicircular canals, they respond to rotational acceleration or angular acceleration, okay? So these guys play a role within rotational, um, or we can say angular acceleration. This is extremely important, okay? These guys, um, this whole semicircular canal system plays a role with being able to maintain a special type of equilibrium, okay, our balance, and they call that type of equilibrium, they call it dynamic equilibrium. So it helps to be able to play a role in maintaining our dynamic equilibrium, maintaining our balance, our posture, when, when we're in actually a rotational or type of kinetic activity. So that covers that. So we understand that he plays a role within rotational or angular acceleration to help to maintain our dynamic equilibrium. All right? So now we actually can go ahead and use this and talk about it in a scenario because that's kind of the best way to learn this. So what we're going to do is, is I'm going to say, let's actually pretend for a second that I am actually moving my head to the right. 
like this. Okay, so I'm moving my head to the right. What's going to happen? That's the best way to learn this. Okay, so let's say that I'm moving my head and I'm going to represent it like this. I'm rotating my head to the right. So this is going to be the right eye. This is going to be the left eye. Okay, so I'm rotating my head to the right. When I rotate my head to the right, I'm taking right now two semicircular canals. All right. And we could say that it could be the lateral, we could say the posterior, we could say the anterior, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying for right now, I'm zooming in on one of the semicircular canals and looking inside of it. Okay? Because if you remember, we had this semicircular canals here. There's this little dilated region right there. That dilated region right there is called the ampulla of the semicircular ducts. So this is called the ampulla of the semicircular ducts, right? What I'm doing is I'm zooming in on that ampulla and looking inside of it. Okay, so this is a part of the actual duct system where the endolymph is flowing. I'm zooming in on the ampulla of that semicircular duct so we can look and see what's happening. And we're looking at right and left. So this is going to be the right semicircular canal, and this is going to be the left semicircular canal. All right, so I rotate my head to the right. When I rotate my head to the right, remember, what was that fluid that's actually kind of circulating in this area right here? What is that fluid called? That's called endolymph, right? When I rotate my head to the right, the fluid stays stationary for a second because of inertia, okay? So when I rotate my head to the right, the fluid, the endolymph fluid that's present within the, the actual right semicircular canal over here is going to stay stationary due to the inertia. But the semicircular duct will continue, the semicircular canal will continue to move. So as that happens, as this actual, there's a rotation, the fluid stays stationary, but the semicircular canal is still rotating. So what happens is, is this endolymph is going to kind of create like a little movement here that pushes on this structure, this criste ampullaris like structure. So again, whenever we're actually rotating our head to the right, due to the inertia, the fluid, the endolymph, actually is going to stay in like a stationary position and as the semicircular canal is rotating the fluid rushes over this actual specialized detector and bends the actual entire Chris ampullaris. You know there's a couple different structures we should talk about here. Son of a gun. Alright so what is a couple of these structures? You see this big red goopy gel gelatinous like structure here? They call this the cupula, the ampullary cupula, because it's in the ampulla, right? The ampulla of the semicircular ducts. Now, underneath the cupula, and this cupula is just basically a gelatinous mucopolysaccharide-like structure. Underneath it, you're going to have these hair cells, okay? These are our hair cells. And remember that the hair cells have those stereocilia with the one big one called the kinocilium. We'll look at that mechanism again, beat that guys in, into your head so you guys really remember that. And there's some supporting cells around that too. Then on top of that, right underneath these hair cells, you have these little afferent nerve terminals. Remember we have the ganglion? There's uh, the vestibular ganglion here, or another one we, we can call it the scarpa's ganglion. Scarpa's ganglion or the vestibular ganglion, whatever you like. The peripheral processes have these afferent nerve terminals that are actually going to be picking up information from these hair cells. And then based upon that information, it can get sent down the central process, which goes to the central nervous system. Okay? So looking at the ampulla, within the semicircular ducts, you have the cupula, which is this big red gelatinous mucopolysaccharide structure. Underneath that, you have the hair cells with their stereocilia poking up into that cupula. Underneath the hair cells, you have this types of afferent nerve terminals, which is connected to scarpa's ganglion or the vestibular ganglion, and the central process is projecting to the central nervous system. And then underneath the hair cells, you might have some supporting cells. So now, whenever you go back to that thing, we rotate our head to the right. As we rotate our head to the right, the semicircular canal will rotate because of the inertia. The endolymph will flow, will actually stay still, but as the semicircular canal is rotating, the endolymph will push on the cupula, bending this structure. So now it's going to bend this way. If it bends this way, okay, there's different types of stereocilia within this area, right? So let's come, let's go over here for a second and zoom back in on this so that we guys, we get this down. Because I know we covered this in the vestibule, I know we covered it within the uh, spiral organ of Cordy, but it's good to just do it again. So, let's say that whenever the cupula bends, 
right? When the cupula bends, let's say that the stereocilia beat towards the kinocilium. Okay, so the stereocilia beat towards the kinocilium. If the stereocilia beat towards the kinocilium, what does it do to the tip links? Stretches them. As it stretches them, what does it do to these actual channels? Opens the channels. If the channels open, who starts coming in? Calcium and potassium. And again, let's just keep it for the sake of it, calcium, and then we'll have here potassium. As all of these cations start flooding into the cell, what happens to the inside of the cell? It becomes extremely electropositive. As it becomes electropositive, what happens to the inside of the cell? It starts becoming depolarized. So then it'll produce what's called depolarization. As that happens, remember, calcium ions are going to be accumulating over here. And it's going to cause the synaptoproteins on these vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane. As that happens, and the vesicles fuse with the cell membrane, what happens? We can exocytose these chemicals. And when we exocytose these chemicals, guess what type of chemicals we release out into this area? We release a special neurotransmitter called glutamate, okay? And glutamate will actually stimulate this actual afferent nerve terminal and send action potentials down the peripheral process to the pseudo-unipolar ganglion, the scarpa's ganglion, again you can call it the scarpa's ganglion, or you can call it the vestibular ganglion, whatever you want. Then whenever it reaches the, the pseudo-unipolar neuron, it'll send information down the central processes to the central nervous system. Okay, now this is whenever the stereocilia beat towards the kinocilium. So the stereocilia is beating towards the kinocilium. What would happen if it was beating away from the kinocilium? The tip links would relax, the channels would close, calcium, potassium can't come in. If calcium, potassium can't come in, it's not going to depolarize, it'll actually hyperpolarize. If it hyperpolarizes, it won't stimulate the exocytosis of glutamate. It won't stimulate action potentials. Okay? So, if we rotate to the right, due to the inertia, the endolymph pushes the ampullary cupula, and let's say that it causes these actual stereocilia to beat towards the kinocilium. If they beat towards the kinocilium, what is it going to do to these, these nerve terminals here? It's going to stimulate it and it's going to stimulate action potentials down the scarpus gang like down the peripheral process to, to the pseudo unipolar neuron where the actual scarpus ganglion is then it'll send these action potentials up through the central processes of this nerve into the central nervous system isn't that crazy okay so this one's going to be stimulated all right this is going to be stimulated let's come over here so now we're rotating to the right. Due to inertia, the fluid stays kind of like stationary, but the semicircular canals are rotating. So as the semicircular canals are rotating, but the fluid has inertia, what's going to happen? The endolymph is going to flow in this direction now. And if the endolymph flows away from this, so you know they call this ampulofugal movement, and they call this one over here ampulopedal movement, so they call this ampulopedal movement, which is going to be towards the cupula, bending the cupula, and then this one is going to be ampulofugal um, movement, which is going to be moving away from the cupula. So if it moves away from the cupula, let's say that it actually causes these guys to move like this. So now it moves in the opposite direction, okay? If it does that, what's going to happen? Let's assume that we, we go back to this again. We look at this, but we take the opposite example. Here's another hair cell here. All right, and we have this guy here, this uh, uh, hair cell. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the stereocilia beat away from the kinocilium in this example. As the stereocilia beat away from the kinocilium, what's going to happen then? Is the calcium or the potassium going to start entering in? No, because those tip links are going to be relaxed now, and so now these guys can't get in. If they can't get in, what starts happening to the inside of the cell? It doesn't become electropositive and actually kind of slightly 
hyperpolarizes. If it hyperpolarizes, what's that going to do then? Is there going to be any release of the glutamate? No. There's going to be no release of the glutamate. If there's no release of the glutamate, are you going to be able to stimulate these afferent nerve terminals? No. So what's going to happen to the action potentials being sent down this actual neuron here? It's going to be not. It's going to be decreasing or pretty much no action potentials. So we'll show it like this. We'll do like an arrow here, like a little positive here. Positive here, positive here, very, showing that this is very little action potentials, and with all of these, significantly large amounts of action potentials. So high action potentials here, down the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, and then very little action potentials coming down the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve on the left side. Okay? Do you guys know what actual hole in the skull this moves through? Okay, as these, because you know this part here, the scarpa's ganglion, these processes will come out and become a part of the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve 8. It'll actually run through a hole in the skull called the internal acoustic meatus, IAC, right? So it'll move through uh, internal acoustic meatus or internal acoustic canal, whatever you like. I'm going to put IAC, internal acoustic canal, all right? So it can move through the internal acoustic meatus or the internal acoustic canal. And then into the central nervous system where it'll actually go to a specific point within the medulla. Okay? So now, this has been stimulated due to the rotation to the right. What happened to the other oh, it is. And then this will be inhibited. Okay? Now, as that happens, lots of action potentials coming from the right side, very little action potentials coming from the left side. Once it does that, it goes to a special area in the brain. In the brain, there's these special nuclei here. Let's kind of draw them like this. There's a superior vestibular nuclei, an inferior vestibular nuclei, a medial vestibular nuclei, and a lateral vestibular nucleus. So this whole thing is the vestibular nuclear complex. So again, up here, you're going to have the superior vestibular nucleus, medial vestibular nucleus, lateral vestibular nucleus, and inferior vestibular nucleus. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the vestibular pathway. For right now, the most important one is mainly the medial, okay? It's mainly the medial one. So, when these action potentials are coming down through these actual vestibular cochlear nerve, it'll go to the vestibular nucleus, but primarily the medial vestibular nucleus. When it does that, it'll stimulate this one. Whereas this one, is it actually going to have any action potentials? Very little, pretty much none, right? So this is actually going to be inhibited. So this is going to have a lot of action potentials stimulating the medial vestibular nucleus. This is going to have very little or pretty much no action potentials inhibiting the medial vestibular nucleus. What happens is, is these medial vestibular nuclei cross. This is crazy, right? So they're going to cross. When they do that, they go to the contralateral sixth nerve nucleus. What is the sixth nerve nucleus? This is actually going to be the abducens nerve nucleus, right? So that's the sixth cranial nerve nucleus. Now, what's really cool about this is whenever this guy, he's stimulated, right? He's stimulated. He's going to send these lots of action potentials. Lots of action potentials down this structure to the sixth nerve nucleus. So what do you think is going to happen to the sixth nerve nucleus? Are you going to stimulate it or inhibit it? You have a lot of action potentials. You should stimulate it. If you stimulate this guy, he's going to send these action potentials to the left eye. What structure? Right here. Here's your nose in the middle, right? Here's your nose. So this is the medial rectus, and this is going to be the lateral rectus. Remember LR6. Lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve. So this guy is going to send these actual efferent axons going to the lateral rectus. If he does that, what will he do to the lateral rectus on the left eye? He'll stimulate it. Okay? So he's going to stimulate the lateral rectus of the left eye. Now, another thing that he'll do. He also is very interesting. He kind of acts as not only just this point here where you can go and stimulate the lateral rectus of that side, but he can kind of act like an interneuron and come up here to the contralateral side and stimulate this nucleus. This is crazy, right? What is this nucleus here called? 
This is called the oculomotor nerve nucleus, or the third nerve nucleus. So again, this is the right side, this is the left side. Again, think about this. If there is simulation to the sixth nerve nucleus activating these actual potentials to the left lateral rectus, then it should also stimulate this pathway. If you stimulate this pathway, there should be lots of action potentials to the third nerve nucleus on the right side. Where does the actual oculomotor nerve go? Well, it goes to many different muscles, but the main one that we're focused on in this example is the medial rectus. So now we're going to stimulate the medial rectus. Why am I telling you guys this? The, here, there's a really important reason. Whenever we rotate, right, in order to be, when we rotate, we want to be able to keep our vision, we want to be able to keep our gaze set on whatever we're looking at. So whenever we're rotating our head, our eyes naturally deviate very fast to the opposite side. So if I rotate my head to the right, my left eye is going to want to abduct. My right eye is going to want to adduct so that I can keep my eyes fixed on whatever I was looking at even when I'm turning. That's the important part of this actual vestibulo-ocular reflex. So the semicircular canals are really, really important for being able to maintain our dynamic equilibrium, but also they're really important that whenever we're rotating, we want to be able to fix our gaze onto whatever we're looking at. Because think about this, if you're running, is your image jumping up and down while you're running? No, it's kind of pretty much held stable. Be thankful that for your semicircular canals and your, your actual macula within the utricle and the sacula because they help us to be able to keep our gaze fixed on whatever we're looking at, even when we're jumping up and down or we're rotating. So that's one of the beautiful things about this. So now, rotated our head to the right. So far, what do we know? We activate the right semicircular canal, send action potentials to the vestibular nucleus on the right side. The medial vestibular nucleus sends action potentials to the left sixth nerve nucleus stimulating him to stimulate the lateral rectus of the left side. After he stimulates that guy, he, the sixth nerve nucleus also kind of acts as an inter neuron and sends action potentials to the contralateral third nerve nucleus, who goes and stimulates the right, what? Medial rectus. So if you think about it, what's this eye going to be doing then? This guy, he's going to contract, he's going to cause medial rotation. This guy is going to contract, he's going to cause lateral rotation. So even though my head is rotating to the right, my eyes are deviating to the left very fast. Okay, so I'm deviating to the right very fast. Now, to look at this again, what about this side? What's happening over here? Why aren't the other ones contracting? Well, look, very little action potentials. You're inhibiting the medial vestibular nucleus. Is there going to be many action potentials going to the sixth nerve nucleus? No, not very many at all. So is he going to be having a lot of action potentials going to the lateral rectus of the right eye? No. So what would happen here? He's going to be inhibited. If that's the case then, is he going to have a lot of action potentials crossing over to the contralateral side to go to the third nerve nucleus? So if he's not going to be sending very many action potentials up to the third nerve nucleus, then he's not going to be sending a lot of action potentials out to the medial rectus. So the medial rectus of the left eye will be inhibited, which will allow for our eyes to move in that way. So I think that's just so darn cool. But now, what is this connection? What is this connection between the sixth nerve? I said it's kind of like an interneuron. It's kind of acting like. But what is this connection here between the sixth nerve and the third nerve nucleus? Special name for it. So since this is on the right side, they're going to call this the uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus. But this is the right medial longitudinal fasciculus. This right here. This one right here is the medial longitudinal fasciculus, but for the left side, okay? This is an important structure. It's helping us to be able to fix our gaze on whatever we're looking at, keep our fovea fixed on whatever the image is, even when we're rotating around. But if you notice something really interesting, whenever you're doing that, whenever you're rotating, your eyes beat to the left very fast, but then guess what they do afterwards? They, they look that way. Well, why do they look that way? Well, our cerebral cortex is really good at being able to keep us oriented and protect us, right? So what happens is we have a specific area um, in the brain. Uh, it's called the frontal eyelid. I, I promise you it's, actually, it's an actual structure. It's called the frontal eyelid. It's actually on the uh, frontal lobe in front of the premotor cortex. So it's called the frontal eyelid, and this is going to be that part of the cerebral cortex 
over here we'll have another part of the cerebral cortex. And again, this over here is going to be the frontal eyelid of the right side. So this is the frontal eyelid. And again, this is the right one. This is the left one. What happens is, is once we move our head to the right, like I said, our eyes beat to the left really fast. But then afterwards, they compensate and go back to the right again as we're rotating. So what causes that? Okay, the frontal eyelids send action potentials down whenever this happens to a special, special nucleus within the pons, okay? There's a special, special nucleus in the pons, this little brown nucleus. What is this nucleus here called? This one. This one right here is called the, this one's got a heck of a name, the paramedian pontine reticular formation. Holy frick, that's a lot. But this is the name of these nuclei, okay? So right here, these guys right here, is called the paramedian pontine reticular formation. Whenever we rotate our head to the right, our eyes beat to the left, but then the cerebral cortex from the frontal eyelid sends these action potentials down. When they do that, guess what these guys do? They come over here and tell the sixth nerve nucleus that. So, before, this guy was contracting, right? He was contracting. Well, now, we don't want him to be contracting. We want the eyes to be able to go back in the normal direction. So, what do you think it's going to do to this guy? Freck. It's going to inhibit this guy. It's going to inhibit the sixth nerve nucleus. If it inhibits the sixth nerve nucleus, what's going to happen to the actual potentials going to the actual lateral rectus? It's going to decrease. As it decreases, is it going to cause stimulation here anymore? No, it's actually going to inhibit it. If that's the case, will our eyes actually abduct on the left side? No. Okay. Well, at the same time, if we inhibit this guy, if we inhibit the sixth nerve nucleus right here, then what's going to happen to the action potentials via the uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus, the right one? That's going to decrease. That means am I really going to stimulate the third nerve nucleus then on the right side? No, I'm actually going to inhibit it now. And now very little action potentials will go to the medial rectus on the right side. What does that mean? That means it's not going to be stimulated anymore. It's going to be inhibited. If that's the case, then what, are the eyes actually going to beat to the left anymore? No, now they're going to start beating to the right. So now, when that happens, and this, the opposite will occur over here, so right, it's going to come over here and inhibit this nerve nucleus, but then what will it do to the other side? It'll actually cause those guys to be stimulated, right? So now it'll stimulate this side, and you get the point. It'll cause what? Let's look. I'm going to take my head to the right. What do my eyes do first? They beat to the left, right? And what muscles contract on the right eye? The medial rectus will contract on the right eye. The lateral rectus will contract on the left eye. But then what happens? Cerebral cortex notices that, compensates for it within the frontal eyelids, the frontal, the frontal lobe, sends action potentials down to the paramedian, pontine reticular formation, who then does what? To the lateral rectus. Now the lateral rectus over here is going to be inhibited. Okay, so now the lateral rectus over here will be inhibited, so it won't be pulling this eye out anymore. Then, on top of that, the medial rectus on the other eye is going to be inhibited, so it's not going to be adducting anymore. But then the exact opposite will happen. Then the medial rectus on the left eye will contract, and the lateral rectus on the right eye will contract, and what will happen? Our eyes will go in the direction of where it was, okay, and with the direction that we were rotating. That is called that actual beating in the opposite direction then. It's actually called cicadic movement. So beating in the opposite direction is called cicadic movement, okay? That right there, that beating of the left and then beating to the right, they call this vestibular nystagmus. So they call this vestibular nystagmus. And this is a normal thing. This happens normally, okay? So vestibular nystagmus occurs naturally. Whenever you rotate your head to the right, activates the right uh, semicircular duct, inhibits the left semicircular duct, goes up through the pathway to the vestibular nucleus, medial longitudinal fasciculus, causes your eyes to beat to the left, right? But then the cerebral cortex compensates and causes them to beat to the right. That is called the vestibular nystagmus. Don't get that confused with other types of nystagmus. <sighs> what happens is there's one of the most common causes of, of vertigo. Vertigo is basically 
the the feeling or the sensation that you think that you're rotating and moving around right even so it's basically kind of like a perception of something without an actual stimulus how does this happen remember back in the video where we talked about the macula they had those otoconia those otoconia those crystals sometimes they can actually get dislodged and when they get dislodged they can actually get stuck in the semicircular canals most common out of all three of these semicircular canals is the posterior semicircular canal. That's the most common one. But you can get some that are dislodged and get stuck within the lateral semicircular canals or the anterior semicircular canals. Why is this important? Whenever you have these otoconia within there, sometimes due to certain types of situations, these otoconia can agitate the ampulla or the, uh, the actual uh, semicircular ducts. If it does that and undesirably stimulates the ampulla of the semicircular ducts, what is it going to do? It's going to send action potentials to your central nervous system telling you that you're rotating when you really you're not. So why would we not want that? Because that can cause vertigo. And vertigo, if you know what happens with vertigo, sometimes it can even initiate nausea and vomiting because of it's so severe. Well, what can we actually do about this? Because they'll produce an astagmus. So if someone has, let's, let's say for a second, that someone has an otoconia, that gets stuck with inside of the posterior semicircular canal. They call this posterior semicircular canal BPPV. Now you're probably like, what the heck does BPPV stands for? It stands for benign, paroxysmal, positional vertigo. This again is one of the most common causes of vertigo. Now, how would you diagnose this? You can actually do what's called a Dix Hall Pike maneuver and we're not going to demonstrate it, but basically what it does, it helps to determine if someone has benign proxismal positional vertigo. Specifically though, if they have posterior canal, benign proxismal positional vertigo, what happens is when they do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, their eyes will actually do what's called a rotational nystagmus. So they'll have their eyes will like bounce around like this. It's called a rotational nystagmus. Okay? That would be telling someone, oh, they have, they have paroxysmal uh, posterior semicircular canal, benign proxismal and positional vertigo. Okay, you know what you can do about it? You can do a special maneuver. They call it the Epley maneuver. And it basically helps to be able to move the otoconia out of the semicircular canals and back into the utricle. All right? What about over here? What if someone has it stuck in the anterior semicircular canal? Well, that's called anterior uh, semicircular canal, benign proxismal positional vertigo. Well, if you do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, what will happen to their eyes? In this case, it'll actually go up and down. What is that called? called a vertical nystagmus. So if their eyes be up and down, that's called a vertical nystagmus. And you can do another maneuver. Uh, there's different types of maneuvers for this one. You can use what's called the Limpert, uh, the, lim the Limpert actual maneuver, and that can help to be able to move the otoconia back into the utricle. And there's one more. One more, this is actually gonna be lateral, semicircular canal, benign, proxismal, positional vertigo. And if you do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, what will happen to their eyes? It'll actually be side to side. That's called horizontal nystagmus. And you can do a type of test called the deep head hanging maneuver, which will help to be able to move those otoconia back into the utricle. All right, engineers, so we pretty much covered the semicircular canals and we covered the vestibulo-ocular reflex, as well as benign proxismal positional vertigo. I hope all of this made sense. I truly do. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, please, I'm begging you, hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and you better subscribe, all right? All right, Ninja Nerds, please go check out our Facebook, Instagram, and our Patreon account. All right, Ninja Nerds, until next time.